second. Okay, Jean, the recording has started. Take it away. Hello, and welcome to the continuation of our 30-minute CA Workload Automation Tech Talk series. Today, we have Calvin Levels, Senior Principal Consultant with CA Technologies, who will discuss some tips and techniques for CA Workload Automation DE. You can download a copy of the slides for today's presentation on the Workload Automation User Community site later today. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit it using the Q&A button on your screen, and we'll address questions at the end. Okay, Calvin, over to you. Thanks, Jean. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here with you today. Uh, I am going to spend about an hour, maybe a little less, uh, going through some tips and tricks uh, with our workload automation DE solution. Um, and these are things that, you know, I, I find in my travels and working with a, a lot of our customers that um, there's some things out there that, that people didn't know about, even people who have been using DE for quite a number of years or quite a long time. So these are just some tips and tricks that kind of get you a little bit more efficient with using workload automation DE, some things that might help you in terms of your scheduling capabilities. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about reporting um, and some other things as well. So just some things that kind of help you get through your day a little bit more efficiently and, and hopefully we'll have some fun. Um, you know, feel free to shoot, some, shoot me some questions. and. If you want to contact me afterwards with any additional questions, no problem. So with that, let's move forward. So we'll learn some valuable tips and tricks to effectively leverage the scheduling reporting features in Workload Automation DE. This is our, uh, I call it our lawyer slide, so we put this up here just as this is informational purposes only. Let's move on from that. So I've got a number of topics, uh, different areas that I'll cover today. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time in the desktop client uh, with some of the customizations that are available uh, that you can do, some things that may help you, you know, remove some of the clutter from your desktop, um, enforce some standards, um, you know, create some defaults and use reusable objects so to make it a little bit more efficient to move around in the desktop. Um, I find that in the monitoring view there is a search capability that a lot of folks don't know about, so we'll spend a little bit of time on that and walk you through that. Um, reporting is another thing that, as I mentioned before, uh, a lot of people just, you know, it, it, the reporting engine is very robust, you know, it's an open source bird engine and gives you a lot of capability, but it can be a little daunting at times, especially if you're not familiar with, with SQL and creating database queries and those kinds of things. We give you a lot of samples, but, you know, it can be a little daunting. But there's some things you can do to kind of help yourself get a little bit of, jump start, of a jump start. Uh, with user reporting. So I'll kind of get you up, up to speed on that and show you some of the things that I did to kind of get myself uh, acclimated and, and a little bit more uh, 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 better with using the reporting. Uh, another thing that I'll spend a little bit of time on is, uh, is the log mains on, on the DE server side. Um, you know, if you've been using DE for a while, especially if you're a, a, an administrator and you're in, in any of the administrative functions as far as cleaning up uh, on, on the, the server side, uh, and the agent side, you know, you know about the customizations in the agent log files, where you can clean up spool files and, and those kinds of things, and 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 get get a kind of cadence around that. But there's some logs in the server directory too that need some maintenance, uh, and so I'll talk about that and, and some ways that you can kind of handle that as well. And then uh, I'll wrap it up just by pointing to to some useful documentation. I always like to do that in these tech talks just to make sure that people know where things are. In terms of documentation, um, we, you know, we moved things to our doc op site. Uh, it's been in place for a while now, and it's it's getting very robust. You know, we've got a lot of good things out there, and it's, it's a very good portal, uh, kind of a one one stop place to go to get all your documentation information. So, I'll spend a little bit of time just walking through that as well, just to show you some some of the things that are available and where you can find things. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the desktop client now. Um, if you didn't know this, there is a preferences dialog in, within the desktop client. If you go into the, the client, and I'll show you this in a moment when I get when I get to the demo portion of this section, but there is a, a preferences dialog that allows you to go in into the different areas like the admin perspective, the define perspective, the monitoring perspective, services perspective, and, and create some, some default properties for a lot of those objects. Um, and I'll show you how that looks, but you can do things like create um, uh, uh, default preferences for event prefixes, 
um, you know, application definitions, notifications, um, defaults for some of the workload objects in terms of the, 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 the parameters and, and the input fields. And these can become very valuable because what they can allow you to do is to standardize a lot of things that you're doing, make it easier to reuse some of these things, and make it kind of easier for you to navigate, okay? okay? They can save you time. You know, they can they can help you establish some consistency. Um, you know, and if you're trying to standardize on things, you can help you in that regard as well because you can use these as templates and, and reusable kinds of things as well. Um, you can get rid of objects that you don't use. I mean, if, you, if you're not using the MicroFocus COBOL uh, job type, you can remove it from the desktop. So you don't have to see it in the palette. You can move things up and down in the palette so that the objects that you use more frequently are at the top of the list rather than at the bottom of the list, right? You can go into that palette and, and, with, and all of those jobs, you can create defaults for them. So then whenever you create a new object, it's already populated with some of the things that you're using. So a lot of, a lot of good things you can do there. So we'll spend a little bit of time showing you, walking you through some of those things. Now, for example, in the area of setting a default prefix. Now, if you've been using DE for a while and you've created events, you've created applications, and, you know, you, 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 you drag a new event into that space, you know that there's a default get master prefix that gets uh, created with that, right? Which is fine. You know, a lot of people, you know, that, that's not a problem. But, you know, a lot of folks, you know, a lot of shops, and, and the best practice is to have some pretty good naming standards, you know, that fit what you're trying to do from an organizational perspective, right? So, you know, SCED master might not be the best prefix that you'd want to use for something like that. So you can actually go in and create a default prefix that will allow you to, to every time you create a new event, to already have that populated it won't be SCED master, it'll be whatever you want it to be. Uh, as you see here, you can also add some other um, defaults to it as well, you know, calendars, the first and second calendar, any priorities, whether you want it to inherit the trigger user, you know, what, how you want to, the, 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 the triggering uh, actions to occur, whether you want to submit it on hold. These are all default things that you can, that you can define for that event. So every time you create a new event, it will have those default preferences, right? So it's all available to you and something that you can use again to enforce some standards, to make it easier for you, to establish some consistency, and not have to, you know, do so much typing. Okay. On the design perspective, you can create some default for your notifications as well. So you can create, if, you, if you've got the same type of email notification that you want to every, every, every application to inherit, you can define that here in the preferences. And every time you create a new application, it will be already be pre-populated with that information. Same with your alerts. Same with SNMP traps. So this is a way that you can, again, enforce some standards, create some consistency, and create some usable, reusable definitions so you don't have to, you know, type everything from, from scratch every time you start. Okay. Um, also, you can remove unused workload objects. You know, for, so, for example, I don't want the microfocus COBOL. I can select it, I can hide it so that it's not in the palette, right? right? I can also, if I want to, you know, every time I create a, a job names and their qualifiers, if I want to use uppercase all the time, you know, if that's a standard that you want to try and enforce, you can make that yeah, pretty pretty easy to kind of do here just by selecting that checkbox and every time you, you create an application and define the job names and the qualifiers, they'll be uppercase. If you have workload objects that you, you use more frequently than the others and you want them to be at the top of the list in the palette rather than at the bottom of the list in the palette, so you have to scroll down, up and down so much, you can define that behavior here. You can move things up. You can move things down. Um, again, hiding them, moving them up and down makes it a lot easier to, to work with those objects. And then combine with the job defaults makes it a lot easier to create those objects as well. Okay. Within that palette, you right you, you right right click yeah, right click on on one of the objects. You get a a, a window here, a, a menu of job defaults that you can click into, and you can subsequently for each of those objects, you can define some default behaviors. You know, what agent does it always run on, or what agent do I want to always use for my environment? I can define that here. You know, if there's default run frequencies I want to apply to that job type, or for anything you know that I want to apply to that job type that's always inherit when I create them, I can define that as behavior here so every time I create a new object, it's already pre-populated, okay, right? Now, the other good thing about this is that, so these are all things within your instance of the desktop client, right? You're going to change all these preferences. You're going to create all these job defaults. Uh, you're going to define all this behavior. 
and that's going to be stored in your desktop client. You know, there's uh, you, you, there, so every time you bring up the, the desktop client, it's going to be there for you. It's, it's relevant to your instance of the desktop client. So you can export these, these definitions um, to a file and you know, store it somewhere. Um, say you've got, you know, your instance at work that you're working at, but you're at home working at something on another machine or you're on another machine, you can use that preferences file and bring it up and go back to those settings as well. Right, so this is a way that you can export those those preferences, import them into a new desktop client. Uh, you can share them with somebody else if you'd like to as well to kind of give them uh, the same kind of palette that you're working off of as well. So you can export those. Um, you can choose which ones you want to export. So you can, you know, if you want to just have one file that contains all your services preferences, you can do that. If you want to have a file that contains all of them, you can do that, or each of the ones individually. Right, so. You can use those to kind of create some different environment the defaults for you as well. So if you're working in, you know, an application-specific environment that has a certain uh, set of preferences that you'd like to use, you can do that, and you can move those around as well. Okay, exporting, importing the same kind of behavior. Um, I can choose which ones I want to import, um, just like I could which ones I want to export as well. Okay. So with that, let me get into a quick demo here. Um, let's see. Okay, I'll share my screen. And I'll get out of this. And I'll get out of this. And I'll get out of this. Okay. So here's my desktop client, right? So let me show you some of these things that I was talking about. So the preferences uh, section is located in, you know, the you go to window, preferences, right? And here we are. Here's my desktop client. Here's all the preferences that I have. If I go into the services uh, perspective, if you notice here, I've already pre-populated this with CA, right? So this is going to be the default, the default prefix that all my events that I create are going to inherit, right? Calendars, if I wanted to do that, um, I can do the same thing with the you know, triggering of events, a minute in the hold, you know, where I want to, what times I want my reports to be, what I want my simulation view to look like, do I want it to have the job details or not, right? So if you see here, I've got, you know, CS, the default prefix. So if I create a new event here, now if you notice here, I've, I've, this, this is an application that I built prior to setting that behavior in place. So all the events have SCED master, right? Now, anybody who's used DE for a while knows that you can't override that prefix once you've created it. You can't, you can't override that behavior once, once it's created. So, you know, that's why it's kind of, if you want to use best practices and you want to have some naming standards that, you know, aren't SCED master or that are more coherent or relevant to your business and your environment, this is how you can do that, okay? Um, so now if I create a new event, you see here, it's giving me a default of CA, right? right? Now, you can change it before you save it, but once it's saved, you can't change it. So, again, you know, taking advantage of that early in the process gives you the ability to kind of enforce standards that make sense for you as a business, right? So, I've got, you know, CA as a prefix here, and every event that I create, you know, it's going to have that behavior in it, okay? Right. Now, if I go over into the define perspective, right? You look at your application default notifications, right? So I can do the same type of thing here. Um, if I want to have some type of a standard notification that I want to establish for, you know, my emails or my alerts or my SNMP traps, right, I can define that behavior here. So anytime a job fails, you know, I want to send an email to – this is just a mail server I have locally on the box here. Use the default subject, you know, failure, job failure, what it going to look like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I create a new application, you notice here it's already pre populated with those preferences that I created, right? So again, this is saving me keystrokes. Uh, this is establishing consistency. This is allowing me to kind of help 
the, the user community and the community at large um, uh, use the standards that we want them to use. Uh, it also makes, from an individual perspective, uh, if I'm working in a specific area, a specific application, and there's certain defaults and behaviors that are relevant to that application, I can define those here, load up that preferences file, and then I can go create those applications, build up that, and probably self and save myself a lot of time. Okay. You know, there's a, there's a number of things here I can do from notifications, again, from alerts, defining, um, uh, I can define different alerts that way too and default behaviors there. Um, you know, what I want the, 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 the graph, I want to go here, you know, with the graph, how I want the, the buttons to show in the toolbar for my graph toolbar, all those kinds of behavioral things I can define here. Okay. From the admin perspective, I can define colors of security. Um, from the monitor perspective, I can define different uh, behaviors here that I want to have uh, relevant at, in that monitor perspective from, you know, the way things look and feel to the way, the way things are hidden automatically, or what kinds of preference or, or intervals, all those kinds of things as well. So a number of things I can do here. Okay. Now if I move over to the palette, oh, one other thing I wanted to show you here. Say I don't want the micro focus, you know, job type. I don't use that. We don't. We never use that. We're not going to use those job types. I can hide it, okay? so it gets hidden from my my palette here. Um, it will be hidden uh, the next time I, I bring that up. Now the other thing I can do. Oops. Let me just pick a Unix job type. If you notice here, this is the palette of job types. If I drag this out without any default, there's nothing in here. There's no no defaults or anything of that sort. But suppose you know I'm I'm in an environment or I'm building an application where every Unix job is going to run on one agent, or I only have you know one agent that I'm going to run this on, right? Or you know something that's you know inherent to that job. But I can go in here and I can say, okay, this this application is always going to run on this agent. You know, I'm always going to have this, this frequency. Uh, I can override the, the application default uh, notifications here for that job type. You know, I'm always going to use this type of behavior for X code. I've always got this set of environment variables that are going to be relevant for that job type. Um, you know, it's not that important. We'll just have a little fun. Right. Right. So again, all these things become available to me. Um, yeah, I can move things up and down as I showed you before with the preferences. So if I don't want some of these things at the bottom of the list, I want to move them up to the top and do that as well. Right. So a lot of cool things you can do here uh, in terms of customizing the desktop, you know, to, to fit your workflow, uh, to help you be more consistent in, in your naming standards, be more consistent in your definitions. Uh, to enforce some standards or make it easier to use the standards that you want to use in your organization. All those kinds of things are available uh, here in that desktop client. Okay. All right, so how do I get back to this? How do I get back to the... Um, So moving on, let's talk about the monitoring view now. So as I mentioned before, um, I find that a lot of folks don't know that there is a search capability within the monitoring view, okay? And what that allows you to do is in the monitoring view, you can go to the search uh, window. Um, you can look for a specific job. You know, somebody, someone asks you, you know, what's the status of that particular job? You don't see it in your console. You don't see it in an, in an application, but you want to go try to find it. And you can easily search for it here. It's a lot of search capability. You can filter by server, by application, by generation, and by job name, um, which gives you the ability to kind of give you a list of those. And if the, the list comes back in, in, in a hyperlink format, format, so you can click on the, the, the search match and go locate that in, in the monitoring view. So that makes it e easy for you to navigate to that instance of that that that, that search uh, uh, value that you return. Okay. 
So let's go look at that. There we go. Getting a little slow on me here. Okay. So if I go over to monitor perspective and I click on the search, right? Application monitor. I've got the server name. You know, I can do search criteria. So let's say I want to find what's that HTFS job that you you were looking for. Um, can't find it. Here you go. Right. So I get a list of them back here in the search uh, criteria. Okay. And from here I can go hyperlink locate it. And you'll see it. Well, it's in here somewhere. Ah, here it is. I'm looking for a failure, that's why I can't find it. There it is. Now you'll see that it highlights the job in the window. Right? Makes it easier for me to find. Okay. Now you can also go look at your views and find a job in your view too. So let's say you got a, you know, let's see, a FTP job or something like that. Don't have any, any of my views. Let's see. I don't see if there's anything here. So in my custom views, you know, my uh, any views that I've got set up here, you know, uh, all the views that we've got listed here, I've created some custom ones for all the views here. Any jobs that I'm looking for that are in those views, I'll be able to search for them here, locate them, right? There you go, right? So you can search in your views, you can search in the application graph and find these objects that you're trying to search for, right? So. That's a pretty good feature to kind of make it easier for you to search around, find some things that you that you're looking for that that aren't uh, uh, you know apparent or that aren't showing up that people may ask you about that you need to go chase down. Okay. Okay. So now let's spend some time on reporting, and we're going to spend a little bit of time here because I, I, what I find in reporting is that, you know, a lot of folks, like I mentioned before earlier, that the reporting functionality and the reporting engine in DE is pretty powerful and pretty robust. It's built off of BERT, which is, you know, a pretty powerful solution that exists that allows you to not only manipulate and create reports around an existing database, the DE database, but also to bring in other objects, you know, SML, XML data, you know, jo joining data with other external databases. A lot of things you can do with BERT to kind of create some reports and do some things, right? So it can be a little daunting at the very outset to try to understand what to do and how to do, especially if you're not a person who has, you know, a, a, a lot of database experience, a lot of, of you know, experience creating queries and, you know, pulling information out of a database, okay? So we, we give you some CAN reports with DE. Um, you know, they're pretty good. You know, you've got, you've got different categories here. You can, you know, you can run a, a default uh, a report 
shows you jobs by application, jobs by state, sales jobs, you know, jobs during the time period, jobs running on a specific agent, you know, a summary report, you know, all those kinds of things, right? You can use those reports um, as templates, okay? Um, you can download those reports from the server. Um, you can't upload them and overwrite the, their existing copies. They're read-only in, in terms of how they exist on the DE engine. But you can download them, make a copy, and reverse engineer them. You can use them to kind of uh, build out some reports. Because a lot of times what I find also, and especially when I was first starting out reporting, is that these, these job types, these, these report types, you know, they were pretty good and, and pretty comprehensive in, in terms of the, the different types of things that you would want to report against. Uh, in, with your jobs and your applications. But maybe I wanted to tweak them a little bit. Maybe I wanted to change the order of the columns. Or maybe I wanted to add another column or something of that sort, right? I could use one of these reports that was close to what I wanted to do, you know, make a couple of changes, you know, maybe rearrange the query a little bit, um, you know, change the format of it a little bit, resave it as another uh, uh, report type, upload it, and there I go. So you can use these and download them, you know, use them as, as, as templates, um, and they're, they're pretty good to help you kind of report or reverse engineer. You know, you just go to the report, uh, and you, you download it. When you go to the download section, you can download all of these, these reports, right? So all the custom reports, all the custom reports, everything that you've created, you can download them, okay? And then once you download them into the report workspace, they're available as templates, and you can just basically right-click on one of these, create a copy of it, and you've got a new uh, template uh, a job that you can work with, a new, a, new, a new workspace that you can work with, and you can customize and tweak that, save it as a different name, and upload it, and you can use that to build and create something new. Okay? So, again, those are the, – the, that's – I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through, you know, details around reporting today. Uh, I am going to show you how to how to use some of these and show you a couple of things that I've done. Um, I think what I'll do the next time we do this is is something that that, that I'll do is I'll, I want to do something on reporting and get a little more detail around reporting. So I'll ask anyone if you've got some you know sample or you know questions or reports that you've been trying to create or something that you'd like to see, you know shoot me a, shoot me a note. Um, you know if I, I get a list of those and enough of the list of those uh, together, I'll I'll do a session a session just on reporting. Kind of walk you through those and show you how I built them, and that may be some a good learning experience as well. So with that, I don't get there. Oops. Let me go back. And let's stop the sharing. And let's go to the DE. And let's go to the reports. Okay. So you notice here I've got all these different reports. I'll close these out so we can kind of show you as they kind of built out all the different report types we've got here. Right? But if I go over to, you know, the report workspace, and I'm just going to collapse all of these, right? Right? You've got all these different reports, and all I've done is download those, right? So, you know, I've just gone to, whoops. You know, it's gone to all these different report types that I've got available here, um, and I've created a bunch of reports here. You know, right? so I've downloaded them all, and I've got these templates here that are available to me. Right? So the job duration, all the all the can reports I've got, I've got these templates that are available to me. Right? And you can use, like I said, you can use these as kind of as reverse engineering exercises. So, for example. You know, you can see here, you know, this report's got a, 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 a kind of graph in it, right? So I want, to, I want to use a similar type of graph from my report. How was that actually built, right? If you double-click on it, you'll see that you can kind of see how it was engineered. You can see the data sources that were picked. Um, you can see, you know, how they built this thing out. Um, you can look at, you know, the actual data sources itself, you know, what queries were run, what were created for this. You know, select you know agent name. There's a there's several queries that were that were built here to do this. You know, selecting from group by unions, all those kinds of things, right? All the more multiple data sources, how this was built, right? And maybe you just want to change you know the output or something like that, and maybe you make it so that 
you've got you know the comms in a different order, right? So select, you know, you can change the order of them just just to do, to do those kinds of things that changes the order of the columns, right? Um, if you want to look at what the results look like, there's no results here. You know, if you want to look at how it was laid out, you know, how the actual format of the report was laid out, right? In terms of, you know, the different objects that were put out there, this is just a bitmap, so maybe you can use this report template to grab your own uh, uh, company logo or, you know, department or whatever it, whatever it is, you know. So all the different objects on that report, you can kind of see here um, how it's laid out, you know, in terms of the sizing, the, the fonts, and all those kinds of things. All those kinds of things you can see here pretty easily. So you can, again, you can take this 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 report and use it as a template to create something that's that's and that's meaningful to you and, and customized according to your 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 requirements, right? Um, some of the others here, you know, this one's got a, a pie chart in it. Right? What does that look like? That's a pie chart, right? I could change the the, the type, you know, if I wanted to. Of course, the data sources of it, right? It's talking about the data sources here. The data sources is the summary data set, which is basically a query, right? So that's the query that's building that 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 chart. So again, you can use these reports, these CAN reports, to create your own kind of cool templates and some of the things that you want to customize around. Okay. Hey, Calvin, okay. before you leave the tool, uh, uh, the question that came in. Sure. Um, how do you make the search but the search button visible in the toolbar? Can you show us how to do that? Oh, in the uh, oh the the monitoring search bar. Yeah. So if you go to the window, like I'm in the monitoring view, right? If you go to the window. There's different view palettes that may or may not be available. Say, I don't even know what the default are. It's been so long since I even saw a default. But all these different uh, views are, are different tool, tools are here, right? So if you don't see the search, you just select it, and it shows up, you know, and there it is, right? So yeah, that's how you can get to it, right? right? And if you want to hide a particular toolbar, and you can do that too, right? So but that's how, that's, that's how you get to it. You just go window, perspective, you know, open perspective, show view, right? Okay. okay. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Right? Okay. All right. So get back to the reports here. Let's see. Uh, I want to go back to... Um, Um, actually, let's go back to the report perspective. Right. So yeah. So again, you've got these different, um, all, all the different kinds of things, the widgets. Um, we 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 show you a lot of them in the default reports. You can use these as templates. Um, you know, I, again, if there's reports that we want to see as a community, shoot them my way, and the next session we'll spend some time really diving into these, and I'll show you how I built them out. I'll show you a couple that I have created. Um, so here's one that says um, I want to show. Uh, let's see, um, job direction. Right. Now the key to, to the report is basically, is, you know, understandably is the data. Right. So that's the key. Is what data is am I trying to retrieve? Making sure that I've got that data, um, um, you know, you know, segmented, um, you know, and and you know, all the data that I need and got it in the format that I want to see, and then I can work around formatting it into the, the report. But the first, the, the biggest you know, hurdle with reporting is is getting the data, right? Um, you know, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking through queries and different functions and all those kinds of things. That's a whole another exercise. Um, it's more of a database based, based exercise. If you go to W3 Schools, um, you know, and search on Oracle or SQL Server, um, they'll give you an entire page of syntax and different commands, right? You know, what I wound up doing in the very beginning to kind of teach myself this was just to ask myself a question, what is it I'm trying to do? What data am I trying to re retrieve? And 
I do a Google search on, you know, how do I sort this, you know, how, what, how do I do this in SQL Server? And you get a bunch of commands. You go search the commands and you, you try using them. And, 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 and usually, usually it's pretty easy to kind of figure out, right? And you can always test yourself out by previewing the results of the report. So this particular query is just selecting, you know, a bunch of data. And what I'm trying to do is just to, you know, look for long-running jobs, right? And all I'm doing is actually not long-running jobs, it's job durations. This is just to kind of print out a report ordered by by seconds, you know, job durations, right? So you know, I use the couple tables in the DE database, which is another thing too, is that the schema for the database is published. So if you're trying to find where things are, you know, where where are run durations stored, and where is job history stored, what tables in the database that's stored in. Uh, there's schema documentation. I'll point you to that here, and, and we get to the, the uh, down the road here, um, what, that can show you where all those things are. But you know, I'm selecting you know certain fields from a couple of databases, and I'm looking for you know, I'm just basically building out a, a report that shows me job durations ordered by second. So. And this, this report I kind of built in my mind to show me, you know, let me see a report on how long jobs are running. So I can kind of see, you know, do I have jobs that run a long, long time, like days, and that shouldn't be? And do they always happen? And, you know, where are those located and where are they? So it to me, a, give me a way to kind of say, okay, where are these jobs that run a long time, right? That's what this report is really what I kind of created it for, right? If you notice here, it just orders by, by, by seconds, you know, those jobs, and it gives a report that gives me that, that job duration in seconds and minutes and hours and days, right? So, you know, I've got a job here that's, that, that ran four days, you know. So, you know, one-time thing, maybe not a big deal, but if I see that same job showing up all the time and it's running longer than it, I normally should, you know, or you know, it runs a long time, you know, I may want to ask, you know, start to ask questions around why that is and what's going on. So that's why I created that report, right? So. You can preview you, the query. The query is the main thing here, you know, building out that query so that it works, you know. Um, previewing the results, make sure that that query works and gives you the data that you're looking for, right, in the order that you're looking for, in the columns that you're looking for. And from there, it's just an exercise of building out uh, the, the, the page so that the, 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 the data is formatted the way you want it to look and all those kinds of things as well, right. Okay, all right. So, you know, the master page and all those kinds of things. So that's how you can kind of figure out what to do here. Now, once I've built that all out, you know, then all I've got to do is save it, right? Save it so it's got all my changes, and then I upload the report project. And then once I upload the report project, then it's going to, uh, let's see. It's going to be here. Once I've uploaded it, now it shows up. Now, if you notice here, the CAN reports don't have this little pencil against them. That's because they're read-only by default. I can download them and make changes to them and save them as another name and upload them as another name, but I can't overwrite them on the server. So that's why you don't have a pencil on them. This, this custom job that I've created, this report I created, job duration, you notice it's got a pencil on it because it's a custom job that I created. So I've uploaded it, you know, I've given it a default template query and duration and all those kinds of things. So now let me just go ahead and run it so you can kind of see what it looks like in a formatted um, uh, context. Okay. So again, gives me a list of my jobs, you know, application job name, when it started, when it ended. How many days it how many days it ran? You know what it was that in hours? What was that in minutes? Right? And I ordered them by by duration. Right? So, and I filtered out the no tool as well, so anything that didn't run, it doesn't show me. So again, you know, just the you know way that I was able to take you know a default uh, template, a uh, default report, you know, look at a query, you know, kind of re -engine, reverse engineer that query to make it do what I wanted it to do. You know, I, I you know used the same uh, layout template as an existing report so that it looked and felt the same way, same color scheme and all those kinds of things. Um, the only thing that was different is the data that's in it, right? 
So again, you can make a lot more changes than I'm showing you here. You can change you know, the colors, you can change a lot of different things. But using these default reports gives you a, a real good way to kind of, you know, not have to, you know, do so much heavy lifting and kind of get a jump start on it. You know, we'll save the, you know, the more detailed reporting kinds of things for another time. But just a little way to get you jump started here. Hopefully that helps. Okay. All right. Now, you know, there's a lot of good useful reporting tips that are out there also to help you kind of get jump started. There's a lot of reference information. Um, if you go into the, the, the desktop client it, it itself and you go to the help uh, screen, um, there's, you know, a, a, a good good in-tech context help. There's a BERT reference guide, um, programmer guide, that, and some example queries, a lot of things you can use to kind of help yourself get started. Matter of fact, I'll just take you there just real quick. I want to make sure that you see that. So I go to help. Content. Whoops, I went over there. They want to go there. There it is. Okay. So BERT programmer reference, uh, the BERT developer's guide, right? There's a lot of good things here on designing reports with BERT, you know. A lot of things with, you know, learning the basics, so there's some tutorials, there's a lot of good things here as well. So, you know, the in-context help within the desktop client is pretty good in terms of getting started. The other thing I'll show you is that if you go to um, the, the, the DocOps, our, our uh, web portal for our documentation, the schema is actually published if you go to the DE Doc Ops page, and I'll talk about that in a moment too as well. But, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a tab that takes you to what the database schema it tells you the, the schema for each of the tables, you know, what the fields are. Um, and this is a way to get to it because a lot of times as, as administrators and probably, you know, if you're not, you know, the primary person who is responsible for DE, and maybe even then you don't have it you don't have access to the actual database, so you can't really go you know go into the the database from a, a, a developer's perspective and you know look at it and peruse it those kinds of things you probably don't have access but you can use this documentation to understand you know what fields are in the database what their their formats are, and where all the information that you're looking for exists okay um you know there's also in this section here I'm using custom reports. There's some sample queries that also will help you get jump started. You know, I showed you a couple that that I that I used, that I created, that I that I tweaked. But here's some good example queries that you can use too to kind of get yourself started too. You know, queries by execution time, by job name, by job state, by specified time ranges, right? So there's some good examples here as well that you can leverage. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go back to the Motley here. There's also a ton of documentation because BERT is, is um, an open source um, uh, 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 package that's been out there for a number of years. So if you go to the BERT site, they've also got a number of, of uh, tutorials and, and, and reference docs as well on what BERT is all about and how to do things like uh, marry DE data with external sources, XML or uh, you know spreadsheets, those kinds of things. Uh, the filter reports, you know, if you if you really think through it and and spend some time with, you could probably get pretty pretty creative with, with that. There's some flash demos that give you some um, you know visual um, uh, demon, demonstrations, some of the things you can do in Bird. A lot of things that are out there too external to uh, uh, what we provide and that that Bird gives you gives you as well. Okay. All right. So another thing that we'll talk about is um, server log maintenance and. You know, I mentioned before that you know if you if you're uh, on the administrative side with DE and you spend time you know administering the server and installing configuring those kinds of things on the agents, you're probably aware of you know the fact that you can configure agents to you know, uh, clean up spool files and clean up the files and, and do maintenance on the the agents themselves so that those files don't you know you know consume space, fill up a file system or something of that sort, right? Just general maintenance types of things. But there's also uh, logs on the uh, DE server as well, right? And those logs will grow over time as well. So there's you know the audit logs, uh, the encrypted 
uh, .bin format files, but they create, create, uh, contain the audit log information. Uh, the CLI command log, so every time a, a DE CLI command is issued, uh, that gets stored in the NCE log file. Uh, there's also trace logs that contain information about server startup shutdown and all the processing, right? You know, we've been triggering those kinds of things, right? So those logs, they're, they're small, you know, you know, uh, uh, pretty small in terms of the amount of data and, you know, based on uh, the amount of data versus the size of the log, but they will grow over time, you know. So at some point, you're going to want to probably think about periodically purging those logs, maybe automating the process to purge those logs so that that space doesn't get consumed, the file system, the server file system doesn't, doesn't fill up. Uh, those kinds of things, right? So just something to think about. So if you look at, um, let me get over into the demo part is because I just show you this. Oops. So I'm in the, um, let's see. So I'm in the DE server directory. This is the Windows box. I'm in the DE server directory. So if you notice here, I've got a number of these log files in here. My, my demo system's not very large. So the log the files themselves aren't very large. You know, I've got maybe, I don't know, 1,000 jobs in here. Um, but, you know, you've got the trace log file. You know, it's pretty good size for my demo environment. So if you're running, you know, thousands of jobs a day, 10,000 jobs a day, millions of jobs, you know, you know, that could get pretty large, right? And they can grow over time. They get archived out every time, trace log every time it, the, the system starts up, you know, these other log files get logged out when startup happens, you know, uh, uh, the start, uh, date changes, those kinds of things. So they will archive, you know, there's always a, a version uh, that's out there that's the current version, but, those, you know, the, the, the previous ones get archived out as well. So you want to clean those up, right? So what I did, and actually I got this from my, my cohort, Mr. Rooney, gave me this. I think he worked it up with another customer here. Um, so I created an application as the delete log file share here is, right? So this is a Windows version of this. I've got a Unix version too if anyone's interested. But really all I'm doing is I just created a command script and just running OS, general OS commands to find out which files are older in a certain time period, you know, 30 days here, and delete them, right? So it's, you know, I've got one job that finds the files and gives me a list of them, and then I got another job that deletes them, right? So just for the sake of, you know, just doing this, because I, I think I probably did this already and got rid of everything beyond 30, I'll just do seven. Eight, eight. It's about 77, right? Trick of that guy. Hopefully it runs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got it on hold, so let me go ahead and release it. I just kind of come in on hold so I can show it to people. And let's see. Um, there it is. All right, okay. And what do we do? Did we get anything? Yeah. Got rid of quite a bit of them, right? So again, I would encourage you to go take a look at that log directory. You know, get a sense for, you know, what kind of volume is being created there, you know, how it's growing over time, and then try to figure out some type of uh, a cadence to, you know, creating a job you know, it's a, an application that will, you know, maintain that and, you know, get rid of those and purge them out so that they don't grow over time. Because, again, that is your DE server, right? You don't want to fill up the file system on the server directory, right? That would not be a good thing. So, you know, it, it probably doesn't require, you know, daily maintenance. Maybe it does depend on your, your volume. But maybe weekly, maybe monthly, you know, you can come up with a cadence right now. But I would really encourage you to try to figure out something that makes sense so that you can kind of keep the environment spruced up, right? 
company. For me, it was just a couple of jobs that just ran OS commands. You can do the similar types of commands for Unix. So we've actually got um, some examples there. If anybody's interested, I will share those with you. Just shoot me a note. Okay. Now we're getting close to time here, and I'm actually going to get, I think I'm going to get through this. All right, so let me stop, uh, let me let me kind of wrap things up just by um, uh, pointing you to some, some of the useful documentation, some of the things that I use on a daily basis. Um, you know, everything is, is out, starts with Doc Ops for me. Um, that's really become a great portal for our documentation. Um, so I've got the latest and greatest information. I would encourage you to get a cadence for going out there checking for platform certifications so that you know, you know, where we're, where we're certifying, you know, latest versions of Linux, Windows, all those kinds of things, right? Um, it's a great place to give you the documentation, to give you additional resources, uh, to get you, you know, to the support side. Uh, a lot of, a lot of things can, are available to you there, <laughs> you know, knowledge base articles, all those kinds of things. It's really a good portal, uh, uh, a first place to kind of start. To, to go where you need to go and, and get what you need to get from from the DE perspective. Okay. Okay. Um, you might want to download the bookshelf. So the the documentation on the Doc Ops is all kind of uh, online. Uh, you can actually download. You can choose to download certain sections or certain PDFs if you like. Um, if you want to keep everything out resident on your 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 internal file system somewhere or an internal repository. Go to the bookshelf, so you can. There's a jump off point within the Doc Ops uh, page to take you to the documentation site, where you can download all the PDFs of the documentation as well, right? So you can, you know, once you get to the the, 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 the documentation bookshelf, you can download them in PDFs or just view them in HTML. So we've got all the documentation there as well. So I would encourage you to go get them if you'd like to have you know, your hard copies and store them somewhere and share them with everybody. Okay. Um, in case you didn't know, we you know the, the, the we've got the, the 11.3 uh, Service Type 5 agents, uh, which came out not too long ago. So there's a page out there that the, the agent stock ops page has been updated to reflect that latest greatest information on those 11.3 Service Type 5 agents, right? So go out there, check for the latest platform certifications, um, and there's also some release notes that talk to you about the. The, the latest and greatest features that were implemented in, in those new agents. Okay, so go check those out as well. Right, and while you're out on the agent site, you know, if, if there's there's a pretty good um, agent uh, guide uh, that's included with the 11.3.4 incremental to download that kind of gives you some really great information. You know, all one place for all the agents did a really good job of putting that together. So I would encourage you to grab that as well because it'll give you some great information uh, uh, on on the agents themselves. Okay, so I'll stop there. Um, uh, do we have any other questions? I don't see any other questions in either of the queues. Okay. All right. So, uh, so for more information, um, you know, obviously I pointed you to the Doc Op site. Um, you know, there's, there's, if you click on this link, it'll take you right to the DE uh, Doc Ops page. The communities continues to be a good place, um, not only for um, uh, knowledge share, um, shooting questions out to the community at large, which includes myself, which includes the internal uh, development support staff here at CA, uh, my peers, um, you know, uh, other customers. So the communities is, and the communities forum is a great place to, you know, throw questions out there. It's a place for ideation. If you've got ideas for product enhancements or, or new things that you'd like to see um, or those kinds of things, right, it's a good place to kind of put those questions in play as well and, and get some feedback on them as well. Maybe they wind up, you know, in the roadmap at some point. Um, you know, support.ca.com continues to be a place for us to, to, to provide you all the support resources you need from downloading documentation, downloading media, to knowledge base uh, question and answers, to opening support issues, uh, tech, uh, tech, tech notes, those kinds of things. You know, I may put some, I, I may even put some, um, some, some, some tech things in here on reporting, um, if I find that those will help some folks as well. Um, also, um, uh, just a general um, uh, site, ca.com is just the uh, WALA slash D is just a general um, uh, product site for, for workload automation. If you want to go grab product brochures, 
um, you know, um, you know, agent brochures, those kinds of things. Those are all available to you as well. Um, in case you didn't know, validate.ca.com is a place where you can go to see what spreads are available to customers uh, and to sign up to register and participate in the sprint. And if you're not familiar with the sprint process, um, so so CA uses an agile development uh, process, right? And it's a customer-driven process where you know feature functions, you know enhancements, those kinds of things are 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 driven by you know customer uh, input, customer involvement. <laughs> the involvement comes in the form of what's called a sprint review, where the team, the development teams, go off and and develop you know certain uh, features that have been you know uh, prioritized based on customer input, and then they will invite you to uh, a WebEx to kind of see what's been built, you know, so it's, it's kind of a, you know, a cadence where they'll develop, show you, go back, develop, show you, go back, develop, show you, go back. And it, it's, it's a very good way for you to see what's being done, to provide input on what's being done, to validate what's being done. So when we have, I, I think there may even be one out there for DE now, I'm not sure, but, you know, if there's, you know, a, a new a development cycle going on for, for, for DE itself or for some of the agents, right? Those are all listed there, and you have the ability to go out there and, and look at those and sign up to participate. You'll get invitations. Uh, I sit in on them as well um, just to see what's doing as well, and, and, and that's because I'm a, and a customer to that, for that as well. So a good place to go to get yourself involved and see what's being done and provide input on this as well. So all these things are great resources. I encourage everybody to take advantage of them. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to us. Um, you know, um, here's my contact information, calvinlevels at ca.com. If you've got any additional questions, um, and if you've got any ideas for reporting that you'd like to see or any questions around that, shoot them my way. You know, next tech talk, maybe we'll just spend the, the whole time just diving into reporting and really getting the kind of next level with that. I'd love to do something like that. So with that, we've got three minutes left. Uh, Gene, I'll turn it over to you because I know there's some other things that you wanted to cover as well. Um, so I'll turn yeah. it over to you advance the slides for me, that'd be great. I just want to remind everyone that the call for speakers for CA World is still open, and uh, we are taking session topic suggestions through this Friday, so please go out there and uh, suggest topics you'd like to see, or if you'd like to be a presenter, uh, go ahead and sign up for a topic there, and we'll certainly consider you as a presenter to, at CA World. Remember, you get a free CA World registration if you present uh, a topic at CA World. Uh, we have quite a few pre-conference education sessions that we're bringing you this year at CA World. We're bringing back the uh, education forum, so there'll be two full days of education at CA World, and with workload automation, we are going to be offering 30 separate pre-con education classes uh, right before CA World starts. So watch for emails that will be coming with the list of topics, and the session catalog should be available by mid-July for you to go out and look at what pre-con education sessions you're interested in attending. All right, next slide, Calvin. Yeah, this just says if you want to suggest a topic, go ahead and click here on this, and all of this can be found on ca.com slash ca world. Okay. Well, I think there are no more questions, so I believe that concludes today's uh, webcast. So thank you so much for your attention, and forward to the next Tech Talk, which is going to be on June 21st. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.